Good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Guido Fad, I'm Associate Professor of Pathology at the Catholic University, and I will be the moderator of this uh, session. I think uh, there's no need to present the, the, the speakers, uh, which are uh, world, uh, the world of the most important uh, authorities in the world in their fields. And uh, uh, the first uh, is a, in 20 minutes, uh, there's a very difficult task. In 20 minutes, uh, they have to, to explain or to discuss very important topics in thyroid disease and the thyroid field. And the first one is my friend, is a professor of, of pathology at the University of Pennsylvania, and he will uh, address uh, the new Bethesda system, 2017, this, uh, there. and uh, I, I think it's a very difficult task, but uh, very, very intriguing. Please. Okay, uh, thank you Guido for inviting me and thank you to the organizers. Um, it is 2017, New Bethesda System, so it is kind of, uh, kind of old when you talk about thyroid, but you know, the thyroid tumors grow slowly, so these guidelines also come back a little slowly. So. Uh, <clears throat> so these are the points I'm going to discuss, and um, as we know, the thyroid nodules are common, and I will, even with all these recommendations and guidelines, most will get biopsied and come to one of the cytopathologist's desks to be diagnosed. And as the good news is that we are not dealing with lung and ovarian cancer, so the less, most of these are going to be well-differentiated tumors or benign neoplasms or hyperplastic nodules, which I also think are tumors. So this was the first edition of the um, Bethesda uh, classification, and I'm not just going to quickly move into the, um, the second edition because I've, I do want to point out or highlight that how good uh, this system was. Um, it's not because I was involved in making this uh, uh, among other people, but I just want to make sure that you guys do realize that how impactful this um, classification scheme was. And what it did actually for me as a cytopathologist sitting on this scope and looking at only few cells which represent this four or two centimeter nodule and making a diagnosis um, was not just about negative and positive, which originally the cytopathologists believe that is either negative for malignancy or positive for malignancy. But as we know, the neoplasms are on a spectrum. It's not so clear cut. Even surgical pathologists, after looking through the entire nodule, still are kind of scratching their heads sometimes. Not most of us, but some at least. So it kind of really, this system kind of reflected the practice of looking at few cells. It provided a spectrum from uh, the adequacy criteria being non-diagnostic and then going towards the malignant. So it really reflected what we were used to and also the terminology that we use in cytopathology. So this was very reflective of the real practice and I think this is what we really have to focus on, that whatever we talk about, recommendations, guidelines, classification, you can list them all. They have to really reflect the real practice and especially our patients. So based upon this and the cytologic uh, preparations that we use, which is smears, thin preps, cell blocks, whatever you use is good, as long as you're used to using it, it really reflected all, uh, in the spectrum, and I don't know, um, it really reflected in the spectrum of, uh, so I don't know which is the point raised in this, but it really reflects uh, from, as you can see, from a benign to malignant, depending upon what type of cells you saw, depending upon the background colloid and the nuclear cytology. So it really, this is what we see every day in our practice. I also want to point out that this was a very important step, not just because we came up with a cytologic classification, but what the pathology community did this was at the same time the other struggles that were happening in thyroid nodule management. We knew that the surgical pathology diagnosis kind of varied from uh, person to person and expert to expert, especially when it came to diagnosing the encapsulated follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinomas. We also knew that the clinical societies were talking about that we are over-treating these thyroid tumors, which are low risk, 
And there were also a lot of ultrasound-based guidelines were coming out from, or the recommendations from the American Thyroid Association and American College of Radiology, even as European societies. And at the same time, there was a lot of stuff being built upon molecular profiling and molecular diagnosis of thyroid tumors. So I think this was the right time for the classification scheme for diagnosing these specimens on cytology. So I got to still, as, as a cytopathologist, working every day and really walking to these thyroid nodule clinics, they started to dabble more into ultrasound features, not to perform or biopsy these, but I started to understand what this really represented, not just like take it for word what the, the clinician told me, this, oh, this is a nodule, suspicious, let's biopsy it. I started to ask more questions, and this, these type of charts actually really helped me because I'm pretty lazy. I just look at the charts, don't read the text. And then here you can see this is from the uh, tyroid. So th I think this has really kind of made us listen more and more to the, to the lingo that is for coming from the clinicians as well as the radiologist. And based upon this, you can really look at these and make sense how these really reflect on cytology as well on histology. So this, is, this was really uh, good that after this, there was a growing body of literature, and I think some good, some bad, some fair. And this, this is actually one of my favorite papers, and it really showed when you make these diagnoses based upon the Bethesda classifications, how these patients, majority of them, are managed. And as you can see, when you're looking at the indeterminate categories, the follicular neoplasm or suspicious or AUS plus, there was more molecular testing be introduced to it, and the surgical approaches were also changing. So it really was, I think it was a full um, kind of a system or paradigm which is managing thyroid, and cytology was a bigger piece of it. Now, what we learned, and naturally when you have these recommendations and guidelines come, they really then you have to see how they reflect the real practice. And this was the original, but remember this was the retrospective review of the literature, and it did not, it represents all walks of life and all thyroid nodules and all practices. What we did realize that because as a cytopathologist or as a pathologist, you're always thinking of benign versus malignant, which is actually not real biology thinking, but we got hooked up on this risk of malignancy defined for each categories. But when it was applied to different practices, different referral centers, academic as well as community practices, this risk of malignancy kind of changes. But as you know, that this risk of malignancy is only based upon the nodules that go under surgical excision. So it is only reflects a piece of that puzzle. It does not reflect the entire population because naturally most benign nodules are not going to go under surgical excision. So then this got really varied, and then people said, well, because this risk of malignancy is not the same, so there's a problem with this classification scheme. But what we forgot to take in account, as I pointed out, is the patient demographics and the referral patterns and who was reading this cytology as well as the surgical pathology. So we really had to pace ourselves because when we really look at these studies, most major studies were coming from these tertiary referral centers and what, is, what cases were being classified as AUS plus, which is like one of the, really the major category which really people feel is a problematic. And these, uh, diagnoses were also being downgraded or upgraded by the second opinions and which patients were going to surgery. So there's a whole this black box that we did not understood and we just got stuck into that this risk of malignancy is really different from the rest. So I think we kind of overestimated the risk of malignancy in these analysis, which were followed through for the first editions. So I think I always kind of question myself that we really overcalculate this risk of malignancy and get so tied to it because it should be based upon our institutional experience and not in, in journal or as a whole. So this actually made more sense to me. So a nodule which you guys define as a low risk or a spongy form nodule on the ATA or tyrets, it really reflects this. I'm trying to find the pointer here. Okay, so it really reflects this macro and macro follicular growth pattern that you see in the benign nodule and really reflects this benign cytology. Similarly, an ultrasound pattern of chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, this heterogeneous pattern, reflects oncocytic proliferation lymphocytes, and it shows up beautifully on cytology also. So this really, to me, was the best correlation I can hope for, and something with a microcalcification very high on the ATA risk group showed these beautiful nuclear features of papillary carcinoma and papillary and somoma bodies.
a nodule which was indeterminate or intermediate and pattern in ATA as well as tyrads. Most of them will be classified as uh, follicular neoplasm. On cytology, will show monotonous population, and they can be either hartle or follicular cell. So it really reflected for me, this is where I really enjoyed cytology, where I can correlate the ultrasound, the cytology, and what was on the gold standard, which is the surgical pathology. Now, let's see the changes that happened before the second edition. I was told that I still have to write the first chapter, and I was assigned a couple of clinicians on that, um, which were like really uh, very astute. So I really have to figure this out, how this is going to be done. But before we even started doing this, as you know, things change in surgical pathology. And I know Yuri is going to talk more about it, as, and you know the classification of the follicular pattern or the lesions which form follicles changed on surgical pathology. And it became actually more simpler and less problematic. So it went into the, uh, based upon whether you have nuclear features of PTC present or absent, follicular adenoma if no invasion, invasion follicular carcinoma. And if it was encapsulated, as you know, have you heard, NIFTP, and if it's invasion, it was more of follicular variant which is invasive. So this became more simpler. But what it did for us, that it changed our risk of malignancy that we are so tied to for these categories. And as you can see, this is multiple studies present. So these are only a few studies that I'm showing it to you. And it really showed that the, this risk of malignancy started to change for these different categories. And actually, the most major decrease was on the cases that we call suspicious for malignancy, because some of these patients go directly to total thyroidectomy or surgical excision. So you can see that this got to make, made a lot of cytopathologists a little wary and a little uncomfortable. <coughs> So let's look at this a little bit more. So this was actually really brought up, and I think this was one of the major changes that was introduced in the second edition. So some of us uh, were again involved in this project, and we actually uh, got together, and this was in Japan. This whole panel was formed to really work on the second edition of uh, cytology. And this is what happened. In the version two, it brought in that change in the risk of malignancy that was being published. So we still, this is a range, and it's not totally reflective of the population that we see, but it got changed so that you can see there was a big change in the risk of malignancy for follicular neoplasm, which went from 10 to 20% to up to 40% and 10 to 30% for ATPF. But what I think was the best part about this was, was that we also included these notes. And it reflected that some of these, because we were really afraid, because pathologists always think of being sued if you call something positive and it turns out to be something not so positive. So we started, this was the big cry from uh, cytopathologists that we should include notes that they can, un that the clinicians can understand. Because they didn't want a surgeon to come to them and say, you called it suspicious for papillary cancer and it's like a benign neoplasm. So we started including this, understanding that the NIFTP diagnosis is not benign, it should not be considered similar to hyperplastic nodule, it's still a surgical disease and it is a low risk uh, neoplasm. Now, I do want to point out this, and I did a little meta-analysis on my own, that the Bethesda system, which is a version two at this point, can also, is very applicable to also the pediatric age group. So you can actually apply the same criteria for diagnosing pediatric nodules, and the risk of malignancies kind of stay the same, but as you can see, there was a high, almost like 100% for things called suspicious. So management may be a little different. Now, when you're looking at this, when you make this version of classification scheme, um, and if you are one of the writers, you always ask yourself whether you did good or there was something is still missing. And I like the version where there's something is still missing because it makes us kind of think about things differently. And I think that's, that's important if you are involved in, in such thing because these are not static uh, guidelines or recommendations. They should be more dynamic and can change with time. So the one thing that I really kind of um, dabble on is the adequacy criteria. What is an adequate thyroid FNA? It's a very simple question. Um, there's a lot been published on this, but if you really look in the literature, it is based mostly upon conventional smears. And some of the practices do not use conventional smears. They just use monolayer preps. And there's no good studies at this point from wild to thin prep that really define these criteria. There's maybe one or two, but now there's no large center big studies. What, so that's why the Bethesda system actually now says that there are exceptions to these adequacy criteria. If a radiologist sees 
completely cystic nodule with no solid component, one can say that this may be compatible with a colloid-filled nodule with a disclaimer that there is no follicular cells. Also, solid nodules with few atypical cells. And I think this is where one has to really think about whether you can call it chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis or totally non-diagnostic cases. So I'll just show you one case later. So, but I think one also has to question themselves that before you call something non-diagnostic, you really have to think about what is the structure of this nodule and what the literature shows. And I think that most of the literature really skews on these completely cystic nodules are where the cyst was the, uh, the major portion of this nodule and how, and also I think the onus is on the operator who's biopsying these nodules. And also which nodules are being selected for biopsy. So I think this, to me, the solid nodules with the ATP is really important um, as a pathologist to really focus on even the cells that you see. So having few follicular cells, that does not mean that it is a non-diagnostic FNA. So I'm gonna show you just this one case that I had. This was a 23-year-old male who had a diffuse thyroid enlargement and a suspicious lateral node, which was biopsied outside and said few cells suspicious for papillary cancer they did not have enough specimen to do further studies. So this is the thyroid that was got biopsy to find this suspicious nodule. Basically, there was nothing, so they stuck this in an area which seemed kind of suspicious. As you can see here, this is mostly lymphocytes and nothing else. And this is the only one group that was, I, and I will tell you, we submitted the entire specimen, and this is the only one group, and you can see a, kind of a barely one nuclear inclusion. So this was, to me, was, was very suspicious. And I called, we sent, the patient said, no, it has to go for molecular. So we did send the vial for molecular. It came back as negative. And this was the follow-up thyroidectomy on this patient. As you can see, there, there is the mostly chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis in the background. And there's one focus of PTC, which was very small. So the needle did pick up few cells from this. So this is the case which should not be called non-diagnostic on FNA because it has those atypical cells, which are very suspicious. So just I'm going to go through very quickly through those slides to the another struggle that we are facing uh, with the after the version two, and I think it is not totally solved. So this is one of a case of a 1.9 centimeter nodule, which only shows these atypical cell groups here. So the thing is to whether to call them atypical, suspicious for neoplasm, or suspicious for PTC, because it does show these beautiful intranuclear group. This case was follow up was a NIFTP. Now let's look at the another case, which has beautiful papillary formations. It actually had even microcalcifications on it. But the way the criteria are changing, you also struggle whether I should be calling this a on cytology as outright PTC or I should hedge because the follow-up may be NIFTP. This is another case which shows microfollicles. You can even see from 10,000 feet, even if you don't do cytology, this beautiful intranuclear grooves, microfollicles, and elongated cells, so it's at least suspicious for PTC. And this is, again, will be some cyto cytopathologists nowadays will say whether I should call it atypical follicular neoplasm or suspicious for PTC. I know most of you will say to do a molecular test, but it may not be possible in all cases. And this case was on follow-up, was an invasive follicular variant of PTC. So why I'm telling you this? Because we are struggling with, because most of us think that when a diagnosis of NIFTP comes out, it means this is a benign disease. And we kind of struggle with whether we should be is this architectural or cytologic ATP as enough to move it up from the indeterminate categories into suspicious versus malignant? So, and I think it's the publicity of NIFTP as benign, and I think the, also the onus lies on the clinicians because there's a lot of articles which kind of treat this as a benign disease. So this is actually are the questions that we ask ourselves. Should I rush to really downgrade my diagnosis? Should I know that the invasive and non-invasive PTC look different at follicular variants on cytology? And I actually do not like those papers who tell you that you can diagnose non-invasive follicular neoplasm uh, with papillary-like nuclear features on cytology. And I think that is basically actually is an impossible task. So this is, this is my struggle to really call, wait for when a case shows me papillary formations somoma bodies as PTC versus something like this, which has a beautiful intranuclear inclusions, also appears as solid and microfollicular. 
But what I think is important is that if you take this in account, you're going to really move the clock into the different direction. And it's going to go, actually, you're going to really increase these atypical diagnoses. And if you're going to call everything atypical, then the cytologic diagnosis really does not matter in the end. You should be doing like HPV testing, everything as molecular. But I think what I really like, and I, I will, I'm glad I was at the morning session and I heard Dr. Trowell talk about that really the pretest probability and how really to stay the hand of really aggressively treating these tumors. So I think there's more to it than just the cytology diagnosis. So this is what I think that today's cytology is, where you bring in the, the ultrasound features, you have your cytology diagnosis, adding molecular tests judiciously, and then it really leads to optimal management. So I consider this cytology in the version two of Bethesda system. It's not just cytologic diagnosis, it's much more of a paradigm, and we are just one box in that to how to really do the optimal management. This is my last slide. I really get very excited when I come to these international meetings because we represent all the races, different religions, different walks of life. And I think in this area, in this era of turmoil throughout the world, I think this is hope for peace. So thank you so much. Thank you. Please, please, uh, please do bear stay because at least one question. Does anybody wants to, to ask a question in the, in the audience? No, it was a great talk, thank you. No, <laughs> no, no. no, no I have a question for you. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> uh, you know, the moderator quick, is not allowed to ask questions. Very quick, very quick question. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, in your opinion, do you, do you have changed your, uh, approach to suspicious lesions of the thyroid uh, uh, after the, the introduction of the NIFT? No, I don't. No, I haven't. Because I think it's, it's not possible. One should not do that. Yes? Let me out. The diagnosis of NEFT-B should decrease the risk of malignancy rather than increase it. No, it decreases. That was the relative decrease, what I showed you. Yeah. The, the, the Bethesda 2 system is showing higher risk of malignancy for the different categories. Well, no, you're talking about the range, and it's the follicular neoplasm and suspicious. No, it's actually because before it used to be 75%, now it's 60. The loss was 15%, now it's around 25 to 30%. Yeah, because if you look at the FLUS, a lot of the papillary carcinoma cases, invasive, that includes invasive FPTCs also. So it's not just NIFTPs. Thank you.